Hello, welcome to another session of Digital Slide Review and Sign Out in Surgical Pathology. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, coming to you from the campus of the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, uh, which is made possible by the Digital Pathology Association and PATH Presenter. Our case today uh, branches into an, a realm we haven't talked a lot about previously. It's liver pathology. The patient is a 56-year-old man who came to our hospital with end-stage liver disease um, to await possible transplant. His accompanying history showed uh, markers of liver failure, um, and he carried a diagnosis of non-alcoholic uh, steatohepatitis uh, to explain and account for his um, uh, cirrhosis and end-stage changes. Um, at this point, I think it's good to think about uh, uh, what are the causes of uh, cirrhosis when we find it on a biopsy. Uh, one of our duties as a pathologist is to attempt to identify the uh, etiology and provide uh, guidance because many times that will help uh, in the therapeutic management of these patients. Uh, so, of course, the most common things that we encounter, of course, are toxin-related, uh, specifically alcohol. Uh, and some drugs, um, as well as viral hepatitis and uh, fatty liver non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. But there are a number of disorders just beneath that in frequency uh, that may go undetected at times, hemochromatosis, uh, Wilson's disease, copper accumulation. Uh, even uh, mild cases of cystic fibrosis can sometimes uh, be presenting uh, with uh, cirrhosis uh, without a known prior diagnosis. Biliary atresia, usually that's known, and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is also an occasional cause of occult liver disease. Autoimmune hepatitis is not very frequent, uh, but also, uh, and also it tends to have some uh, serologic manifestations that help in the identification of that. And then beyond that, we get into metabolic drug disease um, and other uh, much less common uh, viral disorders. Uh, but sometimes because of either historical reliability, the patient's not telling the truth about their alcohol use, or because of inconclusive or unavailable testing, um, maybe due to mul multiple factors uh, impinging on damaging the liver, drugs, uh, virus, et cetera, et cetera, and their stage of presentation, we may be stymied in our ability to uh, fully detect the uh, diagnosis and etiology. Well, uh, because of those things on that list that are of significance, but maybe not always clinically evident or distinguishable by uh, routinely managed uh, uh, blood tests and liver function testing, uh, many times these patients come for a biopsy uh, to evaluate the possible etiology and to provide staging um, and predict response to treatment. So with routine H&E, we can identify fat, we can discern the pattern of inflammation, uh, and we'll talk more about this uh, in a moment. Uh, we can also see what kind of inflammation is present, whether there are plasma cells, lymphocytes, eosinophils, neutrophils, and so forth. We can usually discern the alterations of architecture that may be present um, and define which compartments of the uh, liver uh, anatomy are involved. Um, Oftentimes, uh, ancillary testing, ancillary staining is uh, routine simply because we don't want to miss things that are present on the biopsy that we might not otherwise see. Uh, so even when it may seem to be of low yield, when the history is clear, the serologic results are clear, uh, we do these stains because of that polyfactorial issue. So we do a trichrome and reticulin. Um, oftentimes routinely to detect architectural changes and indicate the staging of fibrosis. We do an iron stain to rule out uh, hemochromatosis. Uh, we may do PAS diastase, looking for possible alpha-1 antitrypsin disease. And in some circumstances, we'll do a copper stain or rhodamine stain uh, to exclude the possibility of Wilson's disease. As uh, there are many uh, staging or grading systems out there uh, for evaluating uh, uh, inflammation and inflammatory patterns. 
Uh, but this is one of the more popular ones, the bats ludwig system, uh, which is useful in staging hepatic inflammation and fibrosis. Uh, in the case of fatty liver disease, maybe a different one, a different situation may be uh, more appropriate. But the grading uh, under the bats ludwig system essentially defines the degree of activity of inflammation from ranging from minimal to very severe. Uh, and this is based on both uh, piecemeal necrosis patterns, as well as the extent and location of the lobular inflammation. So if there's only a minimal inflammation in the lobule, that's a, a, a grade one. Uh, whereas if you have prominent diffuse hepatocellular damage all through the lobule, that's a grade four. And two and three are in between with mild to moderate uh, disease. Um, likewise, with fibrosis, uh, a four-stage system has been advanced um, and is in fairly wide use. Uh, cirrhosis, of course, being stage four uh, and no fibrosis being stage zero. Uh, very minimal uh, fibrous uh, extension, expansion around the portal tracts is stage one um, with rare portal to portal septa uh, pushing things into grade two. When it's kind of not quite there to cirrhosis, uh, but there's uh, some distortion of the architecture, uh, then it would fall into stage three. Well, let's look at uh, the uh, end stage liver. Uh, we can see at low power here in our patient uh, in his explanted liver that we have a nodular pattern uh, with intervening bands of cirrhosis. So sure enough, that diagnosis was correct. We also see some macro nodules here, which might raise concern for a possible dysplastic nodule. Um, and so we'll go down and look at some of these uh, um, hepatocytes and these uh, lobules uh, a little more closely uh, to see what's here uh, and to see whether there's any evidence of dysplasia, neoplasia, or other findings that we should be concerned about. So here we see uh, you know, a mild degree of uh, atypia in the hepatocytes. See a few little protein droplets here and some of the cytoplasm that uh, raises some possible concern here that there could be something going on. Uh, the portal tracts don't show dense uh, lymphocytic inflammation, but of course there's some. Uh, and we can see there's ongoing hepatocyte damage um, and fibrosis around some of these areas as well. Let's go and look at the uh, nodular area uh, here, which is nicely outlined by uh, my uh, resident's uh, ink daughter. Um, and here we see that there is a degree of uh, pleomorphism of many of these nuclei, uh, but perhaps more than anything, look at all of these eosinophilic droplets that we see here. Um, and this, these are uh, quite striking uh, and should raise the question as to what's uh, causing this. Um, is this a dysplastic nodule with some sort of a protein deposition, or are these uh, uh, a uh, deposit we should be concerned about. Well, uh, even on these uh, routine uh, explanted end-stage biopsies, we will oftentimes do the conventional stains that I've mentioned, PAS, trichrome, and iron stain, and so forth. Um, and here is our PAS stain. Now, it's not, uh, it's not often that you can detect this abnormality at low scanning magnification like this. But I think you can see here uh, that in each of these nodules, and more especially in this larger nodule, uh, there is uh, some uh, magentophilic or magenta colored uh, material in these hepatocytes. Um, and here we can see uh, that uh, these droplets uh, that we saw in this nodule are brightly staining with this um, PAS material. Um, they're not diastase, or they are diastase resistant. They are not digested uh, as glycogen. Here, there's only partial digestion of the gly glycogen, so there's some persistence in the cytoplasm. Uh, but even here, we can see that there are uh, many of these droplets uh, in the hepatocytes. Uh, these would be uh, sufficient uh, findings on a core biopsy. Uh, to warrant evaluation. Uh, seeing uh, droplets of this size and magnitude uh, is virtually pathognomonic. Uh, however, to uh, confirm the diagnosis, we did uh, an alpha-1 antitrypsin 
immunohistochemical stain. And again, you can see at low magnification uh, that this lights up each of the uh, um, lobules uh, of hepatocytes and that uh, these uh, PAS positive deposits that we've seen on the uh, H&E and on the PAS stain are lighting up brightly uh, with this immunomarker and uh, of extraordinary size and concentration in this uh, slightly dysplastic type of nodule. So this uh, nicely confirms the diagnosis of alpha-1 antitrypsin disease, deficiency disease, I should say, uh, because in the case of the deficiency, uh, it's not that the body can't make it, it's that it can't secrete it, and so it gets bottled up in the uh, uh, liver uh, because of that uh, blockage. So alpha-1 antitrypsin is encoded on chromosome 14 by the Serpina-1 gene. Uh, and there are several, several mutant variants. Uh, Z is the most frequent and S is the next most frequent allele. Um, in patients who are deficient in this disorder, um, the blockage is one that allows the uh, uh, product to accumulate in the liver. This accounts for less than 1% of the population, so it's not a common disease. Um, but this is the one where you will find the deposits in the liver. In patients who have an absence of uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin, cannot make it at all, uh, of course, they will not accumulate in the liver. They will not have PS positive droplets, but these are even more rare. Um, and those patients who have a dysfunctional alpha-1 antitrypsin, they are able to secrete it. They have normal levels of alpha-1 antitrypsin on serologic evaluation and serum protein electrophoresis, but the, the alpha-1 antitrypsin is not uh, normally functional. It's uh, some, somehow incapacitated. Uh, the mutation not interfering with the, the formation and secretion, but interfering with the function peripherally. So how do we make the diagnosis? Well, there are a variety of ways. Sometimes this is picked up serologically, sometimes on uh, serum protein electrophoresis. Uh, and occasionally, if you're thinking in families, uh, by genotyping. Um, and more often than not, it's uh, going to be picked up on liver biopsy in a patient who has uh, developing liver disease. Because cirrhosis, chronic hepatitis, um, and even hepatocellular carcinoma, as well as portal hypertension, uh, are all known and recognized complications of this uh, deficiency disorder. Emphysematous disease is likewise a problem in these patients. Uh, and so the combination of lung disease and cirrhosis should certainly uh, raise the uh, specter of alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, in your thinking. So our final diagnosis today is uh, cirrhosis, stage four fibrosis, essentially, secondary to alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, it's an unusual uh, situation that a patient arrives at liver transplantation to have this diagnosis made, uh, but certainly not a trivial one as it uh, may be important for the family uh, to know, as well as to recognize um, that the risk of recurrence uh, in this patient following transplant is uh, going to be uh, negligible uh, because his implanted liver should have normal alpha-1 antitrypsin functionality. Well, thanks so much for joining us. If you like this, please uh, hit the subscribe button because we'll continue to release videos like this to help you in your uh, learning and understanding of surgical pathology. Um, and if you have comments, have suggestions, things you'd like to share with us, please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly or in the comments below. We appreciate you taking your time with us to enjoy this case and hope that uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks so much for joining us.